So let's get into the actual extremes of temperature, heat waves and cold spells. So cold spells, I don't really know why we use that phrase instead of a cold wave, but that's, that's the phrase that gets used in meteorology. Heat waves and cold spells, extremes in uh, temperature. So the way that we tend to think about extremes in temperature, where what we've been looking at so far, and there's you know the global average, and then even what I was just showing you locally, it's still like averaging temperature over a lot of days. So like the finest time resolution I was showing you there was one month. So like October, that means you're averaging all of the temperatures in October together. Um, but for heat waves and cold spells, we're usually talking about a shorter time scale, like a daily uh, time scale. And so we tend to think of it like this, where it's like uh, you have on the on a y-axis the daily frequency, the number of occurrences, how often a given temperature value occurs at, at a daily level, and then temperature. And we think of this like you know the typical bell curve or Gaussian distribution is called, or just you know histograms of things. We're used to seeing this a lot in like a grade distribution. Uh, where this might be like a B and then some people get A's and some people get C's and D's. Um, and so it's like the, it's the number of occurrences. And when we look at temperature, it does tend to be distributed something like this, something like a, like a bell curve where we have most of our occurrences somewhere in the middle for where middle is kind of defined by each location. And we have not very many cold events and not very many warm events. And so that's our like, original climate state. And then we think about uh, as it's warming, that distribution is going to move to the right because we have increasing temperatures on this axis. So in a warmed climate, uh, our kind of baseline expectation is that distribution just moves. And so you have a, you have a warmed average temperature at that location. So then you have less cold extremes in this example and more uh, warm extremes. So this, this would be the, the graphic uh, display of warming with more warm extremes and less cold extremes. So can you picture how this would look if you had warming with more warm extremes and more cold extremes? So here's our original climate. So see if you can sketch what that would look like. How could you get a warmed average temperature and have more warm extremes? That's what we're seeing over here. And more cold extremes. Is that possible? You could have a situation where it's warmer on average, so our mean, the, the mean of the distribution goes to the right, shifts to the right. And you can get more warm and cold extremes at the same time. And so you'd have less, because there's a finite number of days, you would have you know, less days in the middle. You'd have more very extreme hot days over here. And you can have more extreme cold days over here as well, right? So in the previous climate, you had a certain number. And in the new warmer climate, you have even more uh, extreme cold days. So that's a possibility. That's a theoretically possible uh, for that to occur. What about this? What, is it, what does it look like if you have warming in the average, but you could theoretically have less extremes in both, uh, both cases? Or instead of, instead of flattening out, yeah, it's going to be more narrow. So it's theoretically possible to have a warmer climate, a warmer average temperature, and have less cold extremes and less warm extremes. That would be possible as well. And then you just, because, because again, there's like a finite number of days and in whatever uh, instance you're looking at, you would have to have then more in the middle, just a lot more days that are right near the average. Okay, so this is just um, another way of looking at the exact same thing. So instead of instead of saying original climate, warmed climate, and plotting them on top of each other, this is just plotting those uh, things over time. So it's saying temperature is now on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. And so this would be the case where your distribution just over time is moving 
up, moving towards warmer temperatures over time. And so then you're getting less extreme cold and more extreme heat. Here's the same thing where it's flattening out. So you're getting warming in the mean, but it's getting wider. And so you're actually getting more extreme cold uh, over time. And then here's the same thing where it's getting narrower. So it's warming in the average, but you're getting less extreme heat and way less extreme cold. Okay, so what do you think is happening in the current climate system? Which do you think is happening under contemporary global warming? Is it A, this is the eye clicker, is it A, where we're warming but keeping the same shapes? We have less cold extremes and more warm extremes. Is it B, we're warming but getting broader distribution, so more extremes on both sides? Or C, uh, warming but narrowing, so we get warming in the average but less extremes, less cold extremes and less warm extremes? Okay, so people say B. This is what I tend to always get on this question. And I totally understand why, because it's very, very common to hear this in the media. And we're hearing it all the time right now in relation to the Texas uh, situation. But I'm going to show you that the evidence is actually very, very weak on this. And in fact, the evidence shows that this is probably not the case and it's more like A. So let's talk about this a little bit more. So this is, here's an example of um, some headlines or at least one headline this week um, talking about the cold extremes in, uh, in Texas. And it says, uh, you can thank climate change for extreme weather patterns wreaking havoc in Texas and across the United States. Um, here's some, here's just a little bit more coverage. Thinking about climate change, that's sort of the big problem we face overall mm -hmm. in that. So just to back up, give you a little bit of context, the podcast is about the power outages in Texas, which are largely caused by um, it being extremely cold and that being very hard on our energy infrastructure. There's all sorts of stories out there about like, that it froze windmills. And so people who are against renewable energy are saying it's because of the, uh, the, with the wind turbines uh, freezing, but really it's mostly the natural gas infrastructure uh, that went down. Um, but so they, they spend the, the first part of this podcast talking about the failure of the electricity grid. And now they're talking about the contribution potentially from climate change. So much of our infrastructure, all of our roads, our sewers, our dams were essentially designed with the climate of the past in mind. But we know mm. that that's now changing, and that's changing very rapidly. And that means a lot of what we had built may not work in the future. We have to plan differently. We have to reorganize so much of our infrastructure to prepare for those changes. And it's just the huge problem of, that climate change poses for not just this country, but all countries around the world. Well, give me some examples of what you mean where the current infrastructure, especially the energy infrastructure, now feels like it was developed for a previous era. So I think one of the most vivid examples we saw pretty recently was the blackouts in California. Mm -hmm. They have been seeing a growing number of severe wildfires. And some of that is linked to climate change. Some of that is linked to the state's forestry practices. But grid operators there during the fire season, they have had to impose blackouts to avoid their power lines triggering large and catastrophic wildfires. So as the fire risk grows, the electric system that they have built has suddenly become incompatible with that risk. Right. They're literally turning off the power to avoid winds knocking over power lines that would then cause even more wildfires. That's right. And you can look at examples outside of the power system. So we know that climate change is going to bring more frequent and stronger heat waves across much of the world. 
And particularly, it's expected to bring heat waves into places that have never really experienced dangerous heat before. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Europe, Europe has, over the past 20 years, started suffering from bigger and more dangerous heat waves. We saw a big one in 2019. There was a really deadly one in, in 2003. And it's not just that a heat wave is hitting this place. It's that a lot of people aren't really adapted to the heat. Their homes may not have air conditioners. Early on, cities had not set up cooling centers for vulnerable residents. And as a result, a heat wave is just much, much deadlier in a place that's not quite adapted for it. So that's another example of where the way we've built in the past is no longer a good guide to what we might expect in the future. Right. And of course, Texas is the most recent example of this, but it was not heat, which is what we associate with Texas. It was a deep freeze. Yeah. And so this is what's really interesting. By and large, we know that as the planet warms up, places like Texas are expected to get hotter on average and suffer fewer colder days overall. Mm -hmm. But there is this interesting emerging line of climate science research that I should say is still pretty hotly debated. But the idea is that as the Arctic warms up, the jet stream, this weather pattern that sort of keeps the icy air trapped in the Arctic, that jet stream can weaken over time, allowing the icy air to escape and to spill over into North America or Europe, causing particularly severe winter storms like the one we saw this week. Hmm. Now, again, scientists are still trying to figure out to what extent this is actually happening. There are some researchers who say, we don't see any sign of polar vortex disruptions increasing over time. This might just happen naturally, even in the absence of climate change. Other researchers say, actually, maybe we are seeing an increase in winter storms, and perhaps this is linked to climate change. So this is a place where the jury is still out. But if it is true, that suggests we may have to prepare for something we didn't expect in the past. Okay, so I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Um, it's actually, I think it's a little too generous to this uh, hypothesis, but I just, I want to give, give it its due first before I um, talk about why uh, I don't think the evidence really supports it. Um, here's also, here's, an, here's another video that um, basically tells you the, the mechanism behind this idea of how global warming could potentially increase uh, cold extremes. Sound hasn't started yet. The average surface temperature in the Arctic is warming more than twice as fast as the globe as a whole. Experts suggest that there may be nearly no sea ice in the Arctic summertime by the late 2030s. That's a quick decline of a lot of ice. That means that in two decades, our North Pole, which we think of as white and icy, could become just an expansive dark ocean. And a dark ocean absorbs even more sunlight, warming the Earth even faster than it is now. As the Earth warms, it does not warm consistently, but the Arctic's disproportionately quick surface warming is raising questions. Our Earth is a mix of many interacting systems between the air, the water, and the land. So scientists are actively studying how melting sea ice and a warmer Arctic might affect other areas of the globe. As some scientists say, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. These are called teleconnections, changes that happen at one location of the Earth that cause resulting changes in a different geographic location. So far, scientists have found that there does appear to be a relationship between the warming in the Arctic and changing patterns in the jet stream. And that matters because the jet stream has a lot to do with the weather patterns that we experience in the United States. So what's the jet stream again? If you've ever flown in a plane across the US, you may remember that it took less time to go west to east than east to west. That's because of the jet stream. It's essentially a river of wind that runs west to east and travels around 200 miles an hour at about 30,000 feet in altitude. Most importantly, 
It dramatically affects our weather. Think about the weather maps of the United States you see in the news. There's always some sort of wavy separation between the colder temperatures in the north and the warmer temperatures in the south. Those cold temperatures that you see come from a giant cold air mass dipping south from the Arctic, and the warm temperatures come from hot air moving to the north from the equator. The jet stream can be found in the atmosphere above where those two air masses meet. This is all important to note because the jet stream is what creates and moves much of our precipitation and storms in the U.S. Its path traces where it's raining or snowing in our country. So when you experience a big snowstorm in the winter, for example, the jet stream likely played a role in guiding the storm to you. To understand how the jet stream connects to the Arctic, we need to explore how the jet stream is formed and also review some basic properties of air. You may remember that as air molecules heat up, they move faster, move apart, and create more pressure. So warmer air has higher pressure and cooler air has lower pressure. Think of a car tire. On an extra cold morning in the winter time, you might find that you have low tire pressure. That's because the air inside of your tires is cold and therefore the molecules are moving slower and exerting less pressure on the tire. Let's apply this concept at a bigger scale. That means that warm air at the equator has more pressure than cold air at the poles. And yeah, it also means that the atmosphere at the equator is also physically taller than the atmosphere above the poles. Crazy, right? Air naturally moves from places with high pressure to places with low pressure. And when air moves from one place to another, it creates wind. So that's where our jet stream comes from. Wind created by air moving from the warm equator, where there is higher pressure, to the cold Arctic, where there is lower pressure. And the west to east nature of the jet stream occurs because the Earth is rotating west to east. But when the average air temperature in the Arctic increases disproportionately to the rest of the globe, like it is now, it changes the pressure and temperature difference between the equator and the poles. This change influences the Earth's winds and atmospheric circulation patterns and has the potential to change the path, speed, and character of the jet stream in unprecedented ways. Because of that, it also has the potential to change the weather patterns in the United States. Scientists have already seen evidence for a potential weakening of jet stream winds, which could cause weather to get stuck since it's not moving as fast. So for example, in a pattern of dry weather, that stickiness could cause a drought over time. Through climate models and observations, scientists are currently studying exactly how the Arctic and the jet stream are connected. These warming Arctic temperatures that we've been talking about are just occurring in the lower atmosphere of the Arctic, and that's just one factor of many that influence the jet stream. We know that Arctic warming can influence the jet stream, and now we have to figure out if it already has influenced it, if so, in what ways, and if it will in the future. The takeaway message here is that the Earth's climate is a relatively closed system. Changes in one area of the Earth will influence other areas, whether they are close together or not. Climate scientists are working hard to keep up with the pace of our rapidly changing planet, and they'll continue to refine our understanding of the weather, the climate, and how they're changing together. Just remember, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Okay, so the basic idea here is just that, you know, because different parts of the earth are warming at different rates, you're going to end up changing some of our uh, circulations. And in this case, they're talking about the circulation associated with uh, the jet stream. And so you don't need to know all of these, um, you know, precise physical mechanisms of how this would uh, come about, but just kind of know that there's uh, theories or there's hypotheses out there that scientists are debating uh, that, you know, would lead to more extreme cold, even as it gets warmer, or they would explain that. So thinking about our uh, kind of pillars of science, they're talking here about this, this theory uh, portion. And it is certainly the case that what happened in Texas in the middle of the United States this week uh, had to do with the jet stream and had to do with what was kind of being shown in that video where you get this undulation in the jet stream and that brings down cold, uh, cold air from the Arctic into 
the central United States. And so that's what you're seeing here is this very, these deep purples are very cold uh, air for that location. This is the absolute temperature up here. This is the temperature relative to the average at that location. Uh, and then this is, this is the jet stream. And so those things are certainly all connected and it's certainly the case that the cold weather in Texas was due to uh, one of these dips in the jet stream and, and the movement of cold air down into Texas. But the question is, do we actually see that type of thing increasing uh, under uh, climate change? And so I think this, uh, this tweet over here uh, encapsulates it pretty well that the kind of the media loves this. The media is way out in front on this. And uh, as far as I can tell, kind of all of the mainstream and left-leaning media brings this in um, into their stories on what's happening in Texas. Of course, right-wing media uh, would not be doing that. Um, but so here's an example from, this is New York Times climate, weather patterns that send freezing air from the polar vortex plunging all the way to the Gulf Coast could, like other forms of extreme weather, be linked to global warming, which is why Catherine Hayhoe uses the phrase uh, global weirding. Uh, and then this is a, this is a climate scientist, uh, Andreas Schmitter. He's at uh, University of Oregon. Um, and he's replying to this tweet, he says, uh, the connection between global warming and a more wobbly polar vortex is highly controversial in the science literature. And I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and then he links to a uh, article uh, from Carbon Brief uh, called how is Arctic warming links to the polar vortex and other extreme weather. Um, and so this, this article, if you're curious, you can um, click on this link. Uh, it's a very comprehensive kind of review of all of the scientific papers. Uh, and there's just lots of back and forth. There's lots of, um, I mean, there are plenty of papers that say that there is a connection, but then there's a lot that say there's not a connection. Uh, and so I'm just kind of pulling some highlights from here. Um, we clearly don't have enough data to be able to tell which of these theories is correct, if any. So talking about um, that there are many theories as to how it could potentially be possible for a, uh, an Arctic warming faster than the rest of the globe to cause uh, changes in extremes like extreme cold at uh, latitudes like at Texas. Um, and they say here, most model experiments, so the climate models, uh, do not suggest that rapid Arctic warming is leading to more disruptions in the polar vortex and widespread severe winter weather across the northern hemisphere, um, but some do. And then here's, here's an interesting one. There's also a theory that a warming Arctic could actually make mid-latitude extremes less likely. And so that would just be because if it's warming faster where it's the coldest, then you're eliminating those cold, those coldest temperatures. And so it's going to be harder to get extreme cold if you're warming the coldest temperatures faster. You're eliminating those from what could potentially spill into uh, the mid-latitudes. So in the scientific literature, in these papers, there's a bunch of back and forth. There's a bunch of different um, theories. They're basically battling in this theory uh, realm of physics uh, and there's not a clear uh, winner for um, the recent past or for the foreseeable future um, but let's think about observations like let's just do a basic basic kind of sanity check on this are cold extremes getting colder or more frequent frequent over time at any location uh, and let's think about like how would we how would we look for this phenomenon of cold extremes getting colder or more frequent frequent in the data. So going back to our three uh, progressions of temperature over time, you know we wouldn't look at the mean, we wouldn't look at um, we wouldn't look at averaging temperatures over long periods of time like over a whole year and then plotting the average temperature for each year over time we'd want to just pull out the most extreme temperatures uh, throughout that year. So like an example would be if I'm in San Jose and I want to know if extreme temperature, extreme cold temperatures are changing in San Jose. I might say for each year going back to 1950, what was the coldest temperature experienced in San Jose for every single year? So just one number for each year. So like back to 1950, then I'd have, uh, you know, 70, uh, 
temperatures. And I could see, is that coldest temperature getting colder over time or is it getting warmer over time? So you're just trying to, you're just trying to sample this very, this very cold end of the distribution to see if that's getting, if that's increasing uh, or decreasing over time. I'm just going to show you some some kind of examples of this. So there's just like a bunch of different ways to to calculate this, but um, here are some examples. So this is the percentage of area in the United States. How much of the United States is experiencing extreme warm temperatures or extreme cold temperatures over time? This is back to 1895 to the present. We see that more and more of the United States experiences extreme warm temperatures over time. And what are we seeing for extreme cold temperatures? We're seeing less and less of the United States experiencing extreme cold temperatures over time. So if we were expect if we were if we thought that distribution was just widening and we were getting more warm and more cold at the same time, then we would expect this to be going up but faster. And then this also to be going up, where we would we would see more extreme cold than we did um, back in the back in the 1900s. Uh, here's an example. Let's just let's just think about Texas. So zooming in on on Texas, uh, this is a graph from 1950, and then this is uh, using climate models. So that's a 2100, uh, and then we have observations here in uh, gray. And what's being plotted is the number of days in a year, in each year, where the temperature was below freezing, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's like kind of the average here is in Dallas, Texas, there's about 41 um, days per year where the, where the temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And what's happening over time? Is that going up? Are we, are we seeing more days below 32 degrees Fahrenheit as time goes on? No, it's going down. And what do climate models project? They project that it should go down. They're so they're saying that extreme cold in Dallas, Texas should decrease. And those models agree with what observations have been showing. Observations are showing that it used to be that there was more days with extreme cold or with freezing temperatures. And that's, that's becoming less and less over time. So it used to be something like 45 days per year, and now more recently, it's like 20, 25 days per year. Um, I'll show you an example over uh, the globe. So here's here's some more links. Um, you can look, you can make your own graphs and look for these uh, yourself. But this is this is a graph. This is uh, looking at the entire surface of the planet. And this is something similar to what I just described of picking out the small, the lowest temperature each February at each location and looking at the trend in those, those lowest temperatures over time to see if that's increasing or decreasing. Uh, and what these, what these reds and browns and, and yellows are showing is that the coldest temperatures at almost all locations on the surface of the earth are increasing. They're not decreasing. We're not seeing an increase in cold extremes. We're seeing a decrease in cold extremes. Uh, and so I, I just picked 1975 to, uh, I think it only goes up to 2018 because that's like a time period when the Arctic has been warming the fastest, but we can go back uh, further. And again, showing the whole surface of the planet, we're seeing a decrease in cold extremes. So the coldest part of the distribution is seeing warming, just like the warmest part. And I actually have, there's just a bunch more kind of graphs I threw on here, um, but they all show the same thing. They're all kind of different ways of slicing and dicing the data and showing um, that heat waves are increasing and cold spells are decreasing. It's what we see in observations historically. It's what climate models project uh, into the future. And if you remember from the IPCC reports, this is what it had to say about extremes. This was like the takeaway um, highest level paragraph about extreme events, that what made it in there, um, changes in many extreme weather and climate events have been observed since 1950. Some of these changes have been linked to human influences, including a decrease in cold temperature extremes and an increase in warm temperature extremes. Um, and then that was, 
represented by this graphic from the IPCC report that they have this downward arrow. Cold days and nights are decreasing. We're seeing less uh, cold days and nights. So going back to this notion that the uh, Texas cold weather is caused by climate change, there are theories out there, as, as we showed, that say that there could be a link, but it's just not supported by observations. And observations are really kind of the central thing that you need first. You know, you want, you want to see something in nature and then come up with a physical explanation for why you're seeing it. Uh, but right now we have kind of explanations that don't even have observations uh, to support them. And when we look uh, globally, it really tends to be, despite what you hear, it tends to be this situation of, of these three in terms of what's happening with temperature distributions. Is there may be a little flattening where we're seeing kind of a disproportionate um, number of extreme warming relative to what you'd expect if the distribution didn't change at all. And like maybe like slightly less decrease in, in cold than you would ex expect if the distribution didn't change shape at all. But for the most part, we are absolutely seeing a decrease in cold extremes uh, almost everywhere. And so this notion that just, oh, global warming makes everything more extreme all the time, it's just not supported by uh, observations or by, by the evidence. So it's interesting that the media loves this. Um, you know, I think there's just interesting dynamics going on about like, there's, it's just, it's so tantalizing. It's so like, if, if you want to, you know, advocate for climate action, it's, it's kind of annoying to have to say, well, you know, it's warming, but we still get uh, cold extremes sometimes. What, what people really like is the idea that it's warming and global warming is causing the cold extremes as well. And, and here's, you know, the reason for that. And so I think that's why it really, you know, um, has caught on and you hear it all the time and it's kind of in every story uh, from the mainstream or, or kind of on the left side of the aisle on climate change. Um, but I would say that it's, it's not very well supported. But there is another, uh, another way of looking at extremes that uh, I'll talk more about today. And this has to do with thinking about how often, how often you get uh, extremes out here on this uh, tail of the distribution. And so we use um, something called a return period to think about this. And then, <clears throat> then the uh, complementary uh, term that gets used with return period is a return shift. And so I'll tell you what that uh, means. So it's basically like this. You have some extreme temperature values. So these are very hot temperatures, right? 105 to 120 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And you're thinking about um, how often uh, you would see values this large or larger at some uh, given place. So you plot in this uh, type of graph, um, essentially how, how often you get these temperatures. So we call this the, the return period. And so the return period just means like how often would you see a value this large or this large or this large or larger? Um, how often would you expect to see that? So like how often would you see that return? Uh, and then the period is just the notion that it's a time interval. So are you going to see, you know, what are you going to see once every one year? So the most extreme value that you see every year on average, what are you going to see once every 10 years? The most extreme value you see every decade on average. Uh, what are you going to see every 100 years? So the most extreme value you see every century. And then the most extreme value you see every uh, millennia. So you get something like this in like a base uh, climate state where this, it has to kind of slant up to the right where um, the, the higher the temperature value goes, the more extreme your temperature value, 
the less likely it is to be seen. So over here, this is you know very infrequent once every millennium. And over here, this is very frequent or relatively frequent once every year. So the warmer it is, the more extreme the value, the less likely you are to see it any given year or the longer you have to wait to see that value again. What is this thing going to do? What is this line going to do under a warming climate? So is it going to is it going to look like this A, B, C, or D. So is our warmed climate going to shift? Is that line going to shift down? Is it going to shift up? Is it going to kind of flatten out? Or is it going to become more vertical? So kind of think about what each one of these things would mean in terms of this return period in these uh, temperature values. Um, B is the winner and B is correct. So here's our original climate and Let's just think about like why this why this makes sense that B is the winner and that B um, is what happens when the climate warms. So we're thinking about now that there's we have a shift in our return period and a shift in our return value, which I'll tell you what that is in a second. So here's our return period shift. So return period, like what this is saying is that in the original climate, um, a you know one in ten year event was something like uh, a temperature of like 114 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and this is now in a warmer climate. We have to expect to see that extreme more often, so it has to shift to the left. So this, this value of 115 degrees Fahrenheit that we used to see once a decade at this particular location, uh, now we see in this warmed climate once every year. So it has to be this kind of leftward shift that just means that you're, that you're getting that extreme more uh, often. And then this is our return value shift. So the return value is just uh, for any given return period, if you're just sitting at your return period, What's the what's the value for that? So, if, like, what is the the extreme threshold that you expect to see once every decade? In the original climate, it's 114, 115 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, but in the new climate, it's like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're shifting that um, that the magnitude of that actual value uh, in the warmed in the warmed climate. Okay, so how about this? question. If I roll a die every minute, so once per minute, what is the return period for rolling a three? Okay, we have a winner with a D at 66%. And that is correct. Right, so die has six sides. And if you're rolling once a minute, then you expect any, so the three has nothing to do with it. I could pick any single number on the die. Um, and all of those would have return periods of six minutes. So a given temperature has a return period of 10 years in a non-changing climate. How do we expect those currencies to be distributed in time? Um, so this is like a hundred years and then the red dots are supposed to be how often we see this given temperature. And so the distinction I'm making here is that we have kind of this very regular periodic uh, occurrence. Here's another one. This one is um, supposed to be somewhat random. And then this one is also supposed to be somewhat random. And so when I say we expect, I don't necessarily mean like exactly like this, but just kind of looks like, looks like that. So the, the way that I'm thinking about it, it's actually C uh, and not A. So A does have a return period of 10 years. So that's not, it's not the case that it's wrong because A doesn't have the right return period. It does have a return period of 10 years. It had 10 occurrences 
in your 100 year time interval. So like B, B would be wrong because there's only five occurrences, right? So that would have a return period of like 20 years on average. And D would be wrong because again, it wouldn't have the right return period. There's too many occurrences. So maybe this would have a return period of like five years or something. So between C and A, this is just something that um, you have to know about the climate system is that these types of events are very random. They just come about through random interactions with um, you know, all of the systems, all the subsystems within the climate system. And they're not these periodic um, kind of cyclical, cyclical things. So even though that's like a very common notion of like how the climate works is that you have these natural cycles and everything is on this, you know, periodicity of in this case, 10 years, that's not actually what we see in data. When we look at like extremes in temperature, they tend to look much more like C, much more like this than this. Um, this would be shocking actually to see in data if you had um, some extreme temperature event that you could just predict every 10 years would happen. That would be a huge scientific story. There'd have to be some very um, you know, neat explanation for that. It would have to be controlled by you know, something like the solar cycle or, or something like that that has a, a very nice periodicity uh, to it. it is, they tend to be somewhat random. So it's very much like the dye itself, right? If you were to, if you were to actually plot in a graph how often you get a three when you're rolling a die, it's not going to be every six times, right? It's going to be um, just kind of randomly uh, distributed. Okay, so let's look at some actual um, projections of return values for uh, temperature. Um, but here is a map of um, this is this is from climate models uh, in 2100 under high emissions. So this is under like um, that very high business as usual RCP 8.5 scenario that we uh, thankfully think that we're not on. Um, so, but this, this would be kind of a very upper bound um, type of projection. And this is uh, changes in 20 year return values. So again, we're looking at this uh, shifts in this thing, shifts in the return value and for 20 years, so it'd be like out, out here somewhere. And so this is uh, the warmest, warmest daily maximum temperature uh, for each year. And so I'll just put on here Fahrenheit, since we're used to seeing uh, Fahrenheit. We see over a lot of land areas, something like 15 degrees Fahrenheit uh, increase in that 20 year uh, return value. So that would mean that if you're 20 year, if you like on average see an 105 degree Fahrenheit temperature every 20 years at some given location, that now that would be 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that's a huge difference, right? Because that's those extremes are what can, you know, totally wipe out uh, crops or, you know, do other major damage to ecosystems or to, to human systems. And so that is a very, very large um, change 